morning ladies and gentlemen, I'm Elliot Miller and welcome to this Stackhouse webinar on video camera basics. It can be kind of intimidating when you start live streaming. There can be this large metal object and you're not really sure how to go about using it. Uh, there's lots of different ways to plug it into a computer, there are lots of different ways to live stream with a camera. You're probably aware that there's this whole history of cinematography that's been developed by Hollywood since like the turn of the 20th century on how to be great at video and that's a lot of information to try and take in. So in this tutorial, well sorry, in this webinar, we're going to try and cover a lot of different topics on how to get the most out of your camera and what kind of camera is right for you. So in this webinar we're going to talk about different camera types and then we're going to move on to composition and depth and how you can use simple cinematic techniques to really improve the quality of your video. Then we're going to go on to the really big one, which is light, and talk about how simple techniques can take amateur looking footage into really professional quality video. Then we're just going to touch upon some of the common mistakes people make when they're entering live video for the first time. Finally, we'll wrap up with our question and answer session. So feel free to reach out to me on chat with any questions relating to these topics that we're covering today. And as well as talking about um, other questions you may have regarding live streaming and cameras. You can reach out to us in the chat uh, in the link. Or you can reach out to us at DACastSF on Twitter. And use the hashtag DACQuestion to submit to me your questions that I'll cover at the end of this talk. We'll leave a large section for the Q&A. Okay, and we're back. Let's really get into this now. Let's look at different camera types and the ways that they all interact with live video streaming. First of all, we've got web cameras. They're really universal and really easy to use. And typically, well, typically they always use a USB plug-in to go straight into your computer and straight into live streaming. Don't be put off by just using a web camera that, you know, some idea that you need to spend thousands on dollars on really expensive camera. Webcams are fantastic if it's just a situation where it's a person sitting in front of a computer talking to you. Um, you don't need to do much more than that. Web cameras can come from a good one, like 20 to $30, uh, upwards of 70 to $80. And they will shoot in very high definition. So. If this sort of webinar focus is what you want to do with live video streaming, webcams are a great fit for you. But let's talk about some of the more advanced types of cameras we can use. Camcorders and DSLRs will typically use the HDMI cable. And HDMI is becoming more and more universal. You can find it in many camcorders, DSLRs, and um, a wide variety of cameras now. You may have seen it yourself, this uh, type of plug, when you're using your Roku device or maybe a Chromecast. They just have an HDMI plug. A lot of TV screens, a lot of monitors now, they're using HDMI plugs. And it can be used for live video as well. Uh, my own personal camera, this is just the one I use. It's a semi DSLR, I guess I'd call it. It's slightly more than your basic travel pick kind of camera, but it's a little bit not quite as advanced as a DSLR with the full lens on the front there. And this has an HDMI port as well, a small one under this flap. So HDMI can also come in micro HDMI, which is slightly smaller. And many kind of mid range cameras will support that, uh, that format. Um, but you will need a cable, that was what I was going to say. You will need a HDMI to a larger HDMI converter uh, in many cases. So let's move on to the next type of camera, SDI. Now this is really high-end professional camera. And you can get a lot out of DSLRs and camcorders, don't get me wrong, they shoot in very high quality these days and are increasingly affordable. However, for the 
full professional filmmaking broadcasting corporation out there, you're more likely to have SDIs. And they have um, a different pl type of plug, again, that the advantage SDI has over HDMI is that it can be used over a much longer distance. So HDMI is fantastic if you have a stationary camera. SDI is more if you're going to have a camera on a crane that's like moving around and is uh, you're going to need a lot more reach to your cable. So let's look at the, the final type and that is of course wireless. Uh, this can include smartphones using apps which you can find uh, on our website if you look up uh, best mobile apps for live streaming on the cast you'll be able to find a good comparison of the different types of mobile apps we have um, as well as uh, cameras like GoPros. GoPros shoot in very high quality. GoPros are amazing. Uh, it really just blows my mind every single time that they're so small and they're such good video quality and they're getting smaller and smaller and better and better. It's just incredible. Um, but they're going to need some kind of wireless connection. Now this is great for mobility. This is great for walking cameras. However, it's so dependent on a really good Wi-Fi signal. And that's uh, not always something you're going to have for sure. So let's ask a really big question here. Do I need a capture card? What even is a capture card? Capture devices come in two different forms. The one on the left is a Teradek Video Pro Cube. This allows us to take feed from our video camera and translate it into a language that can be put into our computer and put into the encoder and live streamed over the internet. One of the great advantage of a capture device is that it takes all of that intensive processing power out of your computer. So it's going to allow your computer to run the encoder more smoothly, um, or at least run your programs more smoothly, I should say, while the, the capture device is going to do all the hard encoding work. Um, alternatively, you can have a capture card which can be installed into your desktop computer. The one in the picture here only has SDI plugins, but you can get them with HDMI or both HDMI and SDI. Uh, much more uh, affordable, I think, than a, a dedicated capture device. However, it is going to put more strain on your computer and obviously cannot be installed into a laptop. So there are some restrictions to capture cards and more and more I think people are tending towards capture devices because they're getting, they're getting reasonable now. Um, you know, maybe I think the cheapest ones Teradek do is around $300, which is not bad really, <laughs> all things considering. So does the type of camera you need, sorry, does the type of camera you have need a capture device. And I'm going to switch. Whoop. I'm going to switch so you can clearly see this diagram I've drawn. Anything that has HDMI or SDI is going to need a capture device in order to translate that into something which can be used for live video streaming. Really simply put, anything that is not USB is going to need a capture device. Um, don't be uh, don't be mistaken by the fact that your computer may have an HDMI plug. I know mine does and that's great if I want to plug it into a monitor or a TV but it is not necessarily means that my laptop here has a the right kind of capture cards to be able to translate that data into something I can use for live video streaming. So keep that in mind that if it's HDMI or SDI or S video or even Firewire, if everyone else remembers live video streaming back in 2009, I know I do, 
um, you're going to need some kind of capture device or capture card to translate that into the language for live video streaming. Even if you appear to have the right kind of port on your computer. Now HDMI is becoming really universal. A lot of capture devices like this Teradek Cube I have on the picture here only have HDMI ports. They do have really high-end professional ones that have SDI ports as well, but a lot of capture devices only have HDMI. So, really simple way to deal with this issue is to look up your camera, look it up online, find what outputs it has, and find that converted to HDMI, plug it into a capture device. Pretty universal these days. Okay, so we've looked at the different types of camera, USB, HDMI, SDI, and wireless. And in the case of HDMI and SDI, pretty much anything that's not USB, we're going to need a capture card. We're going to move on now to the more cinematic nature of video and how we can improve that. And a big thing I want to talk about is composition. It's such an easy thing to get wrong to have a lot of dead space filling the screen. And it is largely something you want to avoid wherever possible. And there are simple tricks we can use to get around this. One such trick is the rule of thirds. To see a full rundown on this, uh, you can check out my Video Camera Basics YouTube tutorial, uh, which is also embedded on the DACAS page and did a full write-up about the rule of thirds. I'm going to quickly cover it for you now. What it basically says is that the screen should be split into three vertical thirds and three horizontal thirds, creating this nine square grid. I'm sure many of you have seen it on your camera display screens. It's often a setting you can have. So let's put it into practice. Here we have a still from an interview style shot that I used um, in the Video Camera Basics tutorial. And if I apply the rule of thirds grid, you can see how my eyes on the right here line up with my colleagues' poles on the left side. And both of our eyes are where the top vertical line and the top horizontal line cross. And we're looking down the horizontal third at each other. This is a really good way to frame an interview because where these lines intersect are our focus points and we want to focus on the eyes and the face of another human being. Where the bottom two uh, lines intersect, those two bottom crosses, are where our hands going to come up when we're talking and that allows us to have a, a second focus point of gesturing and body language which is, again, really good for interviews and watching two people talk. Now, I'm a, quite the perfectionist, and I'm pleased with how Paul looks on the left side. He's got a little bit of space above his head, but not too much, and a little bit of space to the left of him, but not too much. However, me on the right, I think there's a little bit too much space above my head and a little bit too much space to the right side of me. But still, this is a pretty well-framed shot. However, when we take this to the professional level of cinema, we can see some truly incredible things. And a wonderful example I want to show you is Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, which was uh, produced by Fox Searchlight Pictures. And what Wes did is he used depth in his composition to really bring out the rule of thirds. Because when you start applying the rule of thirds in three-dimensional space, rather than on a flat surface, that's when you really start getting quality. So let's take a look at this still here. We have our lobby boy, one of our principal characters, on the far right. And he's nicely filling the right third of the screen. You can see the two pillars in the middle are marking our vertical thirds. And all of this nicely frames Ralph Fiennes playing the hotel manager, perfectly framed in the center square. You can also see the concierge sign makes the one of the horizontal thirds. 
And we've, so we've got this wonderful square effect that's framing Ralph Fiennes. Wes Anderson deliberately used a square aspect ratio rather than a typical cinematic widescreen to really enhance uh, how rigidly every single shot, and I mean every single shot in this movie, obeys the rule of thirds. Let's look at another example. I've met a lot of people in my time in video who think that the focus of attention has to be in the middle of the screen. And that's really not the case. Here we've got a wonderful example. Both of our principal characters are Phil, the far left third. You can see where the two vertical thirds are marked by the bar lights on the top of the screen. What's really clever though is they've put Ralph Fiennes on a chair with his arm reaching up. This has the wonderful effect of filling the top, uh, filling the left third to the top. Imagine if he wasn't there, there would be far too much empty space above the lobby boy's head. But look at the rest of the screen. It's not empty, it's not dead space. We've got objects that make the hotel look like it's in use, and they're not right up against the wall. The wall is slightly further back, giving a nice bit of depth to our shot. It's a really wonderful example of using the rule of thirds where your object of focus is not in the center. Now let's look at this example. This is really nice because you can see the foreground, midground, and background very clearly because we have a principal character in each one. And they fill the right, middle, and left third of our screens. What's really clever though is if we follow this lady's head across Ralph Fine's brow to the lobby boy in the back corner it creates a perfect diagonal third that's cutting the screen across the screen in two dimensions but also in three dimensions across the room to the back corner. Now I'm sure many of you know that a camera on a lens can squash the objects, make them appear closer to each other than they are. But in our, in our mind's eye, in the camera's eye, we've create, uh, sorry, Wes Anderson has created a diagonal third that goes across the flat of the screen image and as well as going to the far back corner in a perfect diagonal third. Now, this is probably the clearest example of the rule of thirds anyone has ever done. You can see our middle third is nicely filled by the bright red carpet, which our lobby boy is walking down. And then just flanking either side of it, you can see the white tiles of the floor peeping through that mark our two vertical thirds. And the left and right third, a nice bright red carpet fills the shot. And to give a bit of depth, we've got our characters in the bottom left corner and in the top right corner of the screen. What is absolute genius about this though, is it's not only a top-down shot that applies the rule of thirds, it also works in full three dimensions. If I was to rotate the camera through 90 degrees, so I was on the hotel lobby floor looking at the back of the lobby boy, it would still perfectly obey the rule of thirds. We would have characters here in the foreground filling the left third and a character in the background filling the right third while our lobby boy strolled down the middle third. It's a wonderful example of the rule of thirds applied in two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. Now I know all this sounds very cinematic to you. I mean you're just Many of us are just doing simple live video broadcasting is is creating a, an artistic work really what we're going for here. But we can still use these simple rules and techniques that have been mastered by filmmakers over generations to really enhance our video. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the classic a uh, person sitting in front of a web camera with a white wall behind them. I'm doing it right now. But 
by making sure you fill the frame correctly, that there's a bit of depth to you, that there's an, perhaps an object on the wall behind you, even a plant or a TV screen, it can really just make the video look slightly better. It's a natural state of proportioning that our eyes are, are used to looking at. So something I think that is a very valuable skill that can really enhance your video quality. And once you get used to it, and once you get used to looking for the rule of thirds, it gets really hard to frame shots badly. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to talk about light. Light is really the difference between professional and amateur video. A lot of people think they need to buy more expensive cameras, better cameras, increase their bit rate, but the best way, the simplest way to improve your video quality is light. And right now I'm trying to get as much light on my face as I can. Um, Maybe I'm not being terribly successful, but I'm really trying. <laughs> I've got all of the lamps on the ceiling pointed at my face and a lamp to the right side of me as well to just try and get as much light on my face as I possibly can. And there are simple techniques we can use to improve not just our video, but also our photography skills, if that is relevant to the work you are doing, to really enhance our, our video quality. As a technique called three-point lighting, and as it suggests, we've got three different lights. The principal light, I'm just going to set this back to monitor capture so you can see the full diagram. The principal light is the key light. This is illuminating our subject. It can be a person's face or simply the object we're looking at. Second to that is the fill light. The objective of the fill light is not to be equal to the key light. We don't want to flatten our image. Uh, by shining too much light on it. We want some shadow and some depth. It makes the the gives the image some depth and, and really improves the quality of it. The objective of the fill light is to be soft and broad and to gently fill in the shadows. It's often only reflected onto the source uh, rather than shone on it directly. Have you ever seen in photog photography shoots those lights that are pointing away from people and they're like looking at an umbrella really kind of weird looking setup but that's a fill light the light shining into that kind of umbrella cone and then being reflected onto the source if the goal of the key light is to illuminate the subject the goal of the fill light is to just turn down the shadows third and finally we have the backlight and the backlight should always be shone at an oblique angle. Its goal is not to shine on the person's back, but to give them an outline, just a golden glow along the edges of their body. This has the effect of cutting them away from the background and making them sound proud and embossed. N now the key thing to take away from free point lighting is that, or lighting in general really, is that none of them are shining on the camera or at the camera. A common mistake I see is the camera looking at a source of light. That's going to confuse and blind the camera. You want as much light on the subject as possible. You don't want the camera looking towards the light. If you're conducting an interview, say, and you've got two people in front of a window, don't have the camera looking out the window in sunny California. It'll blind them, and you'll just have silhouettes uh, left of your subjects. Instead, have the camera on the window side facing your subjects and that bright California sunshine landing on their faces. That's always what you should go for. Now let's take a look at three-point lighting in stages. These stills are from a video tutorial, so I apologize in advance for their low quality. However, it's the best example I've found of three-point lighting applied in stages. Here is step one. We have a man sitting at his uh, laptop with just a simple lamp on his desk, and the only light 
in this shot comes from that lamp. You can see it doesn't look terribly good, but by adding a key light, we can dramatically improve the quality of our video. Already, this looks much, much better. So step one, we've got a, fill, uh, a key light illuminating our subject. Next, we're going to add the fill light. You can see here how the shadows on the dark side of his face are now a little bit softer, and they're not quite as stark as they was were before. Without a fill light, we have quite the film noir, Humphrey Bogart kind of effect, which you may not necessarily be trying to do. Now in this next slide, they've turned down the fill light to really show us the effect the backlight is having. And you can see the backlight now going over the man's ear, down the left side of his neck, and across his left shoulder. See how this takes the shadow that's naturally falling down his neck and on his shoulder, and it cuts it away from the background. It's now its own shadow. It doesn't bleed into the dark background. Instead, he's now standing proud and embossed. We've now applied a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. But as a final touch, the makers of this tutorial added a background light on the curtain on the left side behind him to give a bit more depth and a bit more color to the shot they were creating. So I can show you this is where we started with one desk lamp and this is where we ended with three point lighting. Notice how much more cinematic this looks. Notice the vast improvement in video quality but nothing about the camera has changed. All we have done is applied three-point lighting. Now I know it can be really quite difficult to encourage anyone to spend a lot on lights. Uh, one light is quite an investment for a lot of people, let alone three, to achieve three-point lighting. But there are inexpensive ways to get around this. A great example are clamp lights. These are lights that are used in construction sites. They're durable, they have a versatile clamp for being placed in difficult and awkward locations, and they have a reflective cone for shining the light in a direction. You can buy different bulbs to get different brightness, and they only cost you eight, ten, maybe twelve dollars. And you can get them in Best Buy, you can get them on Amazon. Really cheap. Free lights to achieve free point lighting is only going to cost you maybe $30 if you use some clamp lights. To then soften the light, you can just use baking paper or wax paper and put that over the reflective cone and tape it in place. And that will soften the light and not uh, blind the subjects you're looking at. It's a really, really in a inexpensive alternative to the three-point lighting kits you'll often see advertised. Another alternative is a reflector dish. A wonderful thing about reflector dishes is that they just use natural light. <laughs> uh, these actually have, um, these are quite large, but these actually have um, a kind of spring-loaded wire coil in the outer, uh, outer edge. So you can fold them and crush them, and then when you want to release them, you just they pop out like a pop tent. Um, they often have a very reflective side and a soft side and maybe even some filters. They cost about $20 on Amazon and if you're in sunny San Francisco like we are, it's a really good way to just take that natural light and bounce it onto the source, onto the subject where you want it to be. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about light color. Indoor light is quite yellow and has a, a, a warmth, a heat to it that's 2700 kelvins. This is a, a measurement of heat and it's often used in light as well. Outdoor light, natural sunlight, is much, much brighter, much hotter at 6500 kelvins and has a much bluer 
uh, color to it. So you can see here how we have indoor light, which is quite yellow on the left side of this image, but then we have a very blue outdoor light shining in from the outside. And as I said before, you never want the camera facing a source of light like a window that's blinding it because it will confuse it and this is just one such example. It's seeing yellow and blue light at the same time and the camera is trying to put them together and it just doesn't look right. The key takeaway from this is to only ever have one type of light. If you're shooting outdoors and it's sunny, not a problem. If you're shooting indoors, close the blinds, look away from the windows and get as much indoor light as you can because it's a different color and a different intensity to outdoor light. Alright, let's look at some common mistakes that a lot of people make and these often come from automatic settings that cameras have that are trying to help you, that really just trying to help you. But if you let them run rampant, they can really ruin your video. First one we're going to talk about is gain and noise. Gain is your camera cheating. Anytime it's struggling to cope with a situation, it will use gain to try and increase what it can see. Um, to try and increase the quality, to increase the amount of light it's seeing. You may also have seen it on audio settings, this is called gain. And this is when your, your microphone is trying to force more sound into it. And the more you turn up gain, the more noise you get. It's really apparent when you get the crackling in audio. But you can also get it in video. Here is an example of gain. Uh, this is my camera fully zoomed in. One of the ways it does that is it tries to enlarge the image as much as it can and it starts to cheat, it starts to use gain to make the image appear larger than it actually is. Um, and this creates a lot of noise and you can see how this is ruining the picture on the screen. causes for uh, gain and noise as a result of it. Sorry. Gain is what your camera is doing to try and cope with situations and noise is the resulting bad quality video or audio. Uh, but a lot of people tend to refer to gain solely as the problem. <laughs> it's caused by digital zoom uh, primarily. That is when your camera zooms in further than it can actually see. I can demonstrate now with my camera. Here it is uh, fully zoomed out and then as I zoom in that's it as far as the lens can actually go. Now I'm zooming in further but notice how the lens doesn't move. You can try this with your camera as well. It's probably a white bar that moves across the screen and then stops at a little line and then when you push past that, it goes blue or yellow. Now you're in digital zoom. Your camera is no longer actually zooming in. It's run out of lens to extend. Instead, what it's doing is it's cropping an image and making it larger. And cropping the image and making it larger. And it's stretching it. And that creates noise. Another example is low light, which is, again, one of the reasons why light is the difference between amateur and professional video. If you have a low light situation, you know, any camera, web cameras, DSLRs or SDI, they're going to try and force more light into their lens than they, uh, is available to them. And that creates noise and reduces the video quality. So I'm sure many of you have noticed the best pictures you've ever taken are on really, really sunny days. So as much natural or artificial light as you can get on the camera is going to allow you to avoid noise created by low light situations. And then finally, there's a lot of automatic settings. As I was saying, gain is, tends to be done automatically in cameras, especially in web cameras. And if you, if you let them run, ram, run rampant, they're going to destroy your video quality.
Another example of automatic settings that cause problem is white balance. 90% of your time, your camera is going to set its white balance correctly. What this does is your camera recognizes what the color white is and adjusts the other colors to appear uh, correctly. You, know, you're, you and I know what white is in a way our human brains have evolved to interpret that information but a camera doesn't really understand white like we do it has to be told what color white is and then it adjusts everything else it's seeing according to what it's been told the color white is if there's plenty of light the automatic settings should work fine but we can deliberately set our white balance to get different effects to make sure our white balance is correct um, and it's one of those things that a lot of people aren't aware of so here is an example of Godzilla under three different white balance settings on the far left is Godzilla uh, taking a picture of my camera with automatic white balance it looks fine um, I kind of yeah that's looks like Godzilla um, although the whites are really kind of bright, we've, I would argue we've got a bit of overexposure on his claws and on his toenails that are maybe not quite what we wanted. But it is a decently proportioned color. The middle picture of Godzilla, I set the white balance to, the, to blue. Um, I found a blue object and I manually set the white balance. And I think... Uh, we had some debate in the office over this. I think it's improved the image. I think it's made it look better by bringing out the purple on his fronds and by turning down the white on him. He looks a little bit greener now if you start to stare at his scales a bit too long. But the white's a bit softer on him and the reds and the purples are a bit richer. And I think it looks quite nice. Then on the far right, we have a very extreme example where I have set the white balance to bright red. Um, and you can see how this has the effect of making everything look green. I'm sure many of you have used Skype or other uh, video call services. And maybe the person you're talking to is sitting uh, behind a window. And they move slightly and suddenly there's all this different light, all the sunlight from outside shining on the web camera and now everything's gone very green or everything's gone very blue or things tend to go quite yellow um, if you definitely remember the older days of MSN this would happen a lot because web cameras weren't as good back then <laughs> so that's all automatic white balance from the camera adjusting to different light information and trying to interpret what white is so if there's a situation where uh, cameras are looking from outdoors to indoors or where the intensity or the direction of light may change a lot, it can be a really good idea to manually set your white balance to the color white to make sure you don't have any issues. If you ever want to set white balance, this is the image to look for. You'll be able to find it in your menu somewhere on your camera and it'll be called white balance. This is the icon. When you found this option, Follow the instructions on your camera and just take a picture of white paper um, or a nice bit of white card and tell your camera what white is. And now it's been manually told what white is. Another alternative to this icon is with a square. Um, but more or less it's this white square or circle and these two triangles. I think of it as a, like a trap that's about to be strung. It's trying to capture white and understand what white is. Um, so this is a slightly advanced setting, I would argue, but if you're having problems where the quality of your video is changing a lot and it seems to be changing color, then try manually setting your white balance and your camera will stick to that <laughs> and won't uh, try and change it all the time. All right. We're now ready to start taking some questions. I just want to wrap up what we've talked about today. We've talked about 
the different types of inputs you can have from cameras, so USB, HDMI, SDI, and wireless, and how typically anything that's not USB or wireless is going to need a capture device of some sorts to interpret that information, even if it looks like you can plug straight into your laptop or of a computer. Then we talked a little bit about composition and how the rule of thirds can allow us to correctly proportion and frame what we are filming. And by really adding depth to our shots, we can take our humble live video streaming project and really turn it into something that's a cinematic masterpiece. We have a lot of practice, naturally. Then we moved on to talk about light and how a technique of three-point lighting with the key, fill, and backlight can take amateur video and dramatically improve it. It just makes a world of difference. It really does. And then finally, we looked at common mistakes where zooming in too far or having too little light or not checking what automatic settings can do. All of these can create noise from the gain our camera is using to cheat and try and improve the quality of the video. So watch out for those bugbears by automatically setting the white balance if you feel like you need to. By having lots of light, always have lots of light, that's always going to help. And never zoom in too far. Wonderful. So let's take some questions. Very high quality, can you tell me your settings? Um, we've got a bitrate of about 100 kilobytes. We're using a Microsoft Live HD camera. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying it's high quality. Quite frankly, it's probably the effect of me putting so much light on me. I'm the, in <clears throat> what encoder are you using? I'm using OBS, that's open broadcasting software. It's free to use. It's a little bit fiddly. Um, it is free, after all. Um, it's not the most streamlined of services, but it is very powerful and has a lot of plugins and nice little features that I like. For instance, it was very easy for me to find the settings to make sure I'm also recording this directly to my laptop. How long did I practice before this webinar? Well. I did a previous tutorial uh, called uh, Video Camera Basics for the Cast. You can find that by searching our blog um, or just searching me. My name is Elliot Miller and you'll find it. It's one of my articles. And that comes with a video tutorial. So talking about gain and composition, I covered in that. But last week I spoke at the Demuxed video conference and that's why I included some of the things like uh, Wes Anderson's Grand Budapest Hotel. So. I've kind of been preparing for this over a couple of weeks, really. This is about two or three different talks being combined together. Although, the explaining the different types of video inputs, that was uh, researched this week. The more practice, the better. How did I apply these rules today? Um, so the camera I'm using is a web camera mounted on my laptop. Um, I can't see myself because I've got PowerPoint full screen, so I really hope I'm applying the rule of thirds composition quite well. <laughs> I believe I'm standing in the correct position. I'm not entirely sure. So let me know how it turned out. I'll have to watch the video afterwards. But the more you try to apply the rule of thirds, the more you get used to the idea of where a camera can look and you know what, it's, what the camera is actually seeing, even if you can't see what it's seeing. So just a lot of practice. A lot of practice will eventually give you a vague idea of where you should be standing. Uh, oh yeah, also asking about light sources. As I said, I've just got the ceiling lamps and a desk lamp to try and help, but there's a lot of natural light here in San Francisco. Can you adjust the white balance using only a webcam? A lot of web cameras do not have the option to manually set a uh, white balance, which is what I was saying about automatic settings. They are um, not too, you know, web cameras will tend to automatically do things. I wonder, there's nothing within arm's reach that's bright red that I could show you what happened if I held it up to the screen. But um, if you want to improve 
your video quality, you may want to look at upgrading from web camera um, if white balance is an issue for you. But because your web camera is you're mostly just sitting here in front of them, talking to them, it's stationary, I'm stationary, white balance isn't going to be too much of a problem. Uh, using OBS, do you have camera switching or no? I've got different hotkeys, so if I press Alt-1, the web camera should now be filling the entire screen. Alt-2 is monitor capture. And then Alt-3 is me and the web camera. So you can um, set multiple camera sources and multiple scenes and switch between them in OBS. Uh, like you can with pretty much any encoder. Uh, sorry, Richard. Uh, let me get to your question. I've not mentioned fixed cameras. Um, I believe a lot of high definition security cameras use SDI. I'm not entirely sure, but in any case, look up the type of camera you have and see what kind of output it has. If you're not sure, look up your type of camera online and you should be able to find the information. And then find a, a capture card that accepts that kind of input or find a, that kind of output and convert it to HDMI because pretty much all capture cards at the moment will accept that. Great, so thank you very much for tuning into the webinar today. As I've said, I'm Elliot Miller. I'm the marketing assistant and sort of videographer here at the cast. And you can reach out to me via Twitter at TheCastSF or at Elliot at TheCast.com. Or my extension is, is 103. We uh, had a broken screen on our phones yesterday, so that's changed. I am extension 103, and Adam Pastana, our client services man manager, should be extension 108 now. If not, you can reach out to him at email at adam.thecast adam at thecast.com. So thank you very much for tuning in today and I hope this tutorial has been of some help for you. Feel free to leave comments um, in the post below or reach out to us on Twitter or Facebook and let us know other webinar topics and tutorials you'd like me to cover for you. Thank you very much for watching and bye-bye.